I'm Malika Henderson and welcome to On Background. The Great Recession officially ended in June of 2009, but for millions of Americans, the financial struggle continues thanks to prevalent low-wage jobs, gender inequality in the workforce, and a new wave of boom and bust towns. There are signs of larger hope, however. Today we learn that the U.S. economy grew at 3.6 percent in the third quarter of 2013, but that slowly rising tide has yet to lift all boats. Here to look at the post-recovery American landscape is Kilha. He's the director of state and local fiscal health at Pew Charitable Trust. Also with us is Kate Gallagher Robbins. She's a senior policy analyst at the National Women's Law Center. Thank you both uh, for being here uh, with me. Let's just start off, Kill, with this, just kind of looking at, at the landscape. We've got a graphic here where you look at the, the pre-recession revenue recovery, and some states have done well, right? Uh, since, since the bus, you look at Port Portland, Oregon, uh, Washington, Atlanta, San Francisco, uh, San Antonio, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, Dallas, and Chicago. So there are cities that have done well. Talk to you, uh, talk to us, Kill, if, if you will, about why these cities have done well and why others haven't uh, done so well in this well, it's post recovery? A, it's a variety of factors, um, but one of the things that we noticed in our study where we looked at 30 major cities was the cities that had actually recovered, about a third of the, the 30 in our sample, um, largely the recovery in revenue had to do with federal aid. Um, and, you know, underlying economic conditions, of course. But yeah. in the rest of the uh, uh, sample, about 20 of the 30 cities, they're still struggling and they haven't reached uh, uh, pre-recession uh, revenue levels yet. And, uh, Kate, women, I mean, th there had been some conversation as to perhaps women did better in this recovery than men did. We've got some uh, stats here. Women make up about 50 percent of the overall work uh, workforce, but 80 percent of low-wage jobs uh, and the overall uh, women's increase in low-wage uh, employment over the last three years, 60 percent. Talk to me about how women have fared. Right, I think that's absolutely right is uh, in some senses women have done better in the recovery in terms of gaining back jobs. Yeah. Um, but the question is, is what are those jobs, right. right? What are we looking at? And the fact of the matter is that these jobs are not so great. The 60% figure you cited, you know, the. The idea that 60% of women's jobs that have come back are in are in occupations like waitressing, like childcare workers, those aren't the kind of jobs that can support a family. Right. And I think that's an important part of the recovery for women. And unfortunately, complemented by the loss of the public sector jobs, um, which we know Americans have lost hundreds of thousands of those. Teaching lots of cuts across the these the states. Uh, exactly. And, right. The state right. jobs and. and you know, those are that those African are Americans and women. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, certainly are relied on uh, kill uh, cities as uh, you know, sort of a bellwether and a leading indicator for states. Talk about the importance of cities. Well, cities are generally thought of as the economic engine for their states, but what we found was actually quite surprising. Whereas states had reached their revenue low points in 2009 and then had started to recover, uh, cities didn't reach their revenue low points until about 2010 or 2011. So there's been a about a 12 to 18 month and lag. And that was them dipping into yeah. their rainy day funds and oh, things like that. Well, in order to deal with those revenue shortfalls, they dipped into their rainy day funds, but also many, many cities enacted deep cuts. And and one of the ways that they were able to balance their budgets was to actually cut employees. Okay. Uh, Obama has been talking about uh, economic uh, inequality, the growing uh, wage gap. Yesterday, here is what he had to say. And even though we're bringing manufacturing jobs back to America, we're creating more good paying jobs in education and healthcare and business services, we know that we're going to have a greater and greater portion of our people in the service sector. And we know that there are airport workers and fast food workers and nurse assistants and retail salespeople who work their tails off and are still living at or barely above poverty. And that's why it's well past the time to raise a minimum wage that in real terms right now is below where it was when Harry Truman was in office. 
lots of energy, Kate, around this idea that the minimum wage should become a living wage. People talking about $10 an hour uh, out in Washington State, mm -hmm. uh, a measure out there to raise it to $15. Talk about this cultural moment we're in, where it feels like there's a lot of urgency around this issue, if not necessarily a lot of uh, urgency and movement on the Hill. I think that's right, and we'd love to see more urgency and movement on the Hill, though um, we're glad that states have started to take the lead on raising the minimum wage. I think that's really contributing to the moment you're talking about. California's minimum wage is going up. New Jersey just voted to put theirs up. And it looks like right here in D.C. we're going to see an increase as well. And I think it would be fantastic. I mean, the 725 federal minimum wage it's not enough to keep families out of poverty. And an important point uh, to think about for the minimum wage is minimum wage workers are women. They're two-thirds women. And so when you're talking about raising the minimum wage, you're really talking about raising women's wages and working on and that. household wages, right? Oh, because yeah. women have kids, and they're often, uh, in, in many cases, the single breadwinner for some of these houses. You know, I mean, that, that's absolutely right, and uh, analysis has shown that if we raise the minimum wage to $10.10 .10 an hour, one in four working mothers is going to get a raise. Um, Kill, I wonder if you could talk about uh, sort of Obama there talked about the service economy, but there's mm -hmm. also a knowledge economy, right? And those mm -hmm. are the places where you find uh, that there is a concentration, right, of highly educated folks. Talk to me about what those, uh, those cities look like. Well, those are the cities that have invested in uh, its economic future and that have actually sort of solidified its balance sheet so that it can make those types of investments in education and the infrastructure. Um, what we found was that um, you know, many cities continue to struggle to essentially pay for those basic upgrades in, in roads and um, as well as the other infrastructure that facilitates the knowledge economy. Um, as as uh, Kate mentioned, you know, uh, there were drastic cuts to teachers in the education system, and that's that's not going to hurt. Uh, that's only going to hurt states in the long run. Um, and, and right now, they're struggling to basically restore some of those um, uh, services that they cut during the Great Recession, while also planning for future downturns. Talking to Kill Hall, uh, Kill Hall and Kate Gallagher. Robbins about uh, growing income uh, inequality and, and some of the conversations going on around these boom and bust cities. You see in some of these cities, uh, Kate, th these knowledge centers, mm -hmm. um, we're going to put up a graphic here, in Silicon Valley, for instance, the have, uh, haves versus the have-nots, one in five ultra-wealthy Americans live there, and these, this is defined, uh, the ultra-wealthy defined as a uh, net worth above 30 million. I'm sure you mm -hmm. guys un understand that. Uh, but also in Silicon Valley, food stamp participation is at a 10-year high, mm -hmm. and homelessness is up 20% since 2011. Yeah, I mean, it's, I keep going back to this phrase, two Americas, and it's not, it's two Americas in, in cities, right? And mm -hmm. in, in these places where very wealthy people living and there's no middle class. I think that's absolutely right, and that's why I think this discussion about the high-tech jobs juxtaposed with the low-wage jobs right. is so important because you see what is happening to America's workforce, and the fact of the matter is the middle is disappearing. Yeah. You know, the kind of standard, you could get a good job, you could support your family, you could do what needed to be done. Those jobs are simply not there anymore, which is why we need to start raising wages, making sure people can live on their earnings, because as the president noted, P these people are working their tails off out there, you know, and they deserve it. Detroit, w bankruptcy, mm -hmm. they're going to be able to declare uh, bankruptcy and certainly has implications for other cities in terms of what the judge there uh, decided. Also seems to me, when I think about Detroit, you just think of the end of an American way of life. I mean, certainly you think that there were all sorts of problems there, but mm -hmm. Detroit was a city uh, that was able to be a boom city because of these jobs where people who didn't have high school educations could still uh, provide for their families. Yeah, I mean, Detroit is um, uh, an icon for all the wrong reasons now. Uh, back in the 1950s, it was one of the largest cities in America, and, and now with a population of just under 700,000, uh, it's a city that's been on a steady road to decline. Um, essentially, bankruptcy was a measure of last resort for the city. It, it essentially ran out of any wiggle room and had no choice but to essentially um, uh, declare bankruptcy and now it's faced with a very difficult decision of um, you know putting police officers in the streets paying for school systems or you know in, in many instances cutting pensions 
Uh, Kate, what's your sense of what this means? You know, if you look across the country and you talked a, a bit about women here, uh, does does this gap, this growing uh, equality and in income gap, mean something different for women, for African Americans, for African American women? I mean, yeah. talk to me about that. No, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? Because it's not just two different Americas, which it is, but it's who's part of which America, essentially. And, you know, women are definitely on the lower end. They're filling these low wage jobs. They're poor. And it's worse for vulnerable groups of women. So, single African -American mothers. African women have African 10% unemployment rate, something like that. It's really shocking. I mean, 11.5% last month for Af of African American women were unemployed. And, you know, that's a number that has just barely edged down since the recovery started. And so, you know, those women, particularly who used to be in public sector jobs, they're just not finding the employment. They're still looking, right, but they're right. just not finding it. Yeah. So kill 11 million people out of work, 7.3% unemployment rate. Six in 10 people say they are nervous about uh, their job status. I mean, what so, I mean, what sort of solutions are there? Are there certain cities? I mean, we talk about these knowledge centers, mm -hmm. but I imagine uh, going from someone who is a low wage uh, worker to someone who can then then participate in the sort of called knowledge economy is a very a big leap. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's where you might see some of the disparity between the revenue recoveries of, of particular cities. Yeah. Um, there, cities, you know, or in the short term, have very little control over, um, how, you know, influencing the economy. Um, they, they, they have uh, very little control in terms of their industrial mix over the short term, as well as the kind of uh, uh, what their labor market looks like. But they can start investing in longer term solutions that if essentially sort of create the conditions for economic growth by investing in infrastructure, making sure that they have a class uh, world class education system and things of that nature, but that requires that they basically get their balance sheets um, on the right path. Kate, last question to you. Are we at a tipping point in terms of, of this issue? I mean, uh, Obama yesterday very much saying this could be you or I. It's not just poor people. It's not just people in the mm -hmm. inner city. It's not just black people or brown people. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone is vulnerable in this, in this new scary economy. I think we are at a tipping point, you know, and, and the president's speech yesterday highlights that, that this is a moment where we can either choose to make investments in our cities, in our people, in our families, or we can choose to keep making public sector cuts. We could choose to not extend emergency unemployment benefits that families depend on. You know, we could choose to keep the sequester going. I mean, these are a set of things that we have really policy levers to use, which is a very hopeful hopeful tale, right. but only if we use them. Only if we use them. I mean, you imagine come 2014, 2016, this will be a very big debate uh, in on the campaign trail, and we'll see how it all turns out. Kate Gallagher Robbins of the National Women's Law Center in Kilha. This has been your second time. Thanks so yeah, much, sir, for, for coming. Back again. Director of State and Local Fiscal Health at Pew. That's our show for today. Thanks again to our guests for joining us. Now it's time for our Twitter question of the day. Nearly four years after it began, how do you feel like the economic recovery is coming along? Tweet us your answers to at background and use that hashtag postback. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.